Hi, uh, I'm feeling a little better and I'm hoping that uh, my health uh, holds out. And uh, I wanted to talk about some of the topics in world history that I had uh, started with and, uh, you know, haven't really been able to keep up with because of ups and downs with my health. So uh, I wanted to talk about the history of the world as a kind of organizing structure for all the other social sciences. Uh, in the same sense that all of natural science is reducible to physics, in other words, chemistry is physics at a different level of spatial organization, uh, biochemistry and then ecology, all of those are made of the same primary stuff which physics t explains to us and discloses. And uh, in that same way, history is going to be the uh, kind of uh, central dividing line uh, in terms of understanding the human sciences. And here I mean things like politics or ethics or law, uh, but also things like literature and art and religion. Uh, any of those human activities, like say literary criticism, which offer people real insight and understanding in the world, but aren't uh, reducible to physics. So uh, that's one of the things that interested me about the history of the world as a topic. And uh, also, when I first came out of graduate school, uh, Philip Curtin was the chairman of the department at Johns Hopkins, and uh, he offered me my first job, a two-year postdoc, and I agreed to make up a, his a history of the world course from scratch. And uh, it was uh, a difficult and complicated uh, job to take because uh, I could go into a, a university library and no matter what path I took, even if I walked randomly from one floor to another, everything there was historical. Everything had a history in the same th sense that it's equally true to say that everything has a physical uh, construction. It's made up of matter and energy and space and time. Um, so I was just looking at this giant library at Johns Hopkins and uh, I decided that I wanted to organize my history of the world around the relationship between uh, the human sciences and uh, the distinctly human qualities that people have and the natural sciences, which would include uh, living things and would also include human beings. but. Uh, while human beings might be exhaustive, or, or while, while uh, say, bacteria might be exhaustively described uh, by, through the, the, uh, uh, the methods of natural science, um, my sense is, is that very complicated organisms like human beings uh, require a different set of uh, assumptions and a different set of explanatory templates because uh, there are significant qualitative differences between people and bacteria. It's not that the analogy isn't sometimes useful, it is, but human beings do things for reasons, they have purposes. But nobody nowadays asks about the purpose of uh, the planet Neptune, in other words, is it in the right location? Is it spinning in the right direction? Those are silly, or at least I regard them as silly, nonsensical questions. Same sort of thing is uh, uh, works for human actions as opposed to the, to the uh, events we describe in natural science. Consider John Wilkes Booth. Um, we, he shot Lincoln <clears throat> and no doubt any competent historian would agree that F equals MA will give us a, a good account of the motion of the bullet from the gun to the President of the United States. On the other hand, we would describe the, the velocity and the uh, acceleration and uh, the mass and all the, the physical properties of it. But no one would be tempted to say that that was a wicked piece of lead 
or that that was a justified uh, physical object, or that that the uh, conduct of that bullet in killing Lincoln, that that was immoral. But we ask just those questions and we make just those assumptions about John Wilkes Booth. And the reason why is that unlike a, an inert piece of metal, John Wilkes Booth was a real complicated structure, as all human beings are. And uh, he was just doing this for a reason, a political reason, and to attribute that kind of explanation to uh, a human being makes perfectly good sense. But it doesn't make any sense to apply the idea of uh, purpose or intent to the bullet. Bullets just do what they do. That's why we don't hold a trial for the bullet. That's why we don't put it in jail. On the other hand, human beings are, have a level of complexity which emerges in the process of evolution. And uh, this emergence uh, creates a disjunction between human beings and uh, the other species that we inhabit the planet with. Okay, so I want to talk then about uh, the relationship between physics and social science. And uh, then I'll be able to have a, a move into uh, uh, some of the main historical and archaeological issues that are currently being settled. Okay. Um, every time we have a scientific revolution, there is of necessity uh, a corresponding revolution in the human sciences or rather, what I might say, the arts and sciences. So things like politics and uh, uh, political thinking, uh, rhetoric, uh, painting, architecture, all of these have to be transformed when people's understanding of the world around them is transformed. So it's possible to have a, a transformation in the human sciences, in say religion or art. Uh, think about the rise of Islam or think about uh, the development of perspective in Renaissance art. Neither of those events uh, produced a corresponding scientific revolution. The causality doesn't work that way. My argument is that the understanding of the physical world is something roughly analogous to the uh, operating system that uh, a particular kind of cybernetic activity, I mean, which I think is mappable onto brain states, um, I, I wanted to uh, give an account of that and at the same time be willing to say that we have a different set of criteria and a different set of categories when we talk about human beings. It's not that they are these ethereal things that are not biological or chemical or physical. It's that they're more than that. And this is an emergent property. Okay. The big point I'm trying to make is that evolutionary biology and history are continuous activities. In other words, these kinds of investigation are conjoined. If we're thinking about history properly, it should be uh, a conceptual extension of whatever natural processes got human beings to the point where we, they could differentiate themselves from everything else. Uh, for my purposes, I think that that's the point at which people begin creating and deploying symbols. So for me, history is going to start, oh, 50, 60,000 years ago. You know, the, the, uh, the backward dating always changes, but this will be in the final movement out of Africa. People learn how to create symbols, and what that does is allow uh, thoughts to be accumulated and banked 
because they no longer died with the particular thinker that produced them. So uh, what makes us separate from everything else is that we invent symbols, we use them, and we use these symbols to bank socially accessible knowledge. And in a, a very few generations, that banking process is going to start producing interest. So um, we have a, new, a discipline in history that understands itself to be breaking down that distinction between the natural sciences and the social sciences because both of them are true about human beings, right? It's not true one way or another to the exclusion of others. Uh, now, every time we get that scientific revolution, there's a revolution in the social sciences. So the earliest uh, mythical versions of physics, they had epic or legend, uh, which was the corresponding social science, a kind of uh, farmer's almanac, which had all kinds of miscellaneous thoughts and customs and expectations built into them. They were educative tools. Now, after the first scientific revolution, which happens in, uh, in Ionia, in the 600s BC, uh, between Turkey and Greece, um, that was transformative because once we got this new secularized, uh, demythologized, causally necessary physics, uh, that meant that all the other things in our culture and our intellectual heritage that are related to this or contingent upon that particular understanding of the world, they are in great danger. They can no longer be sustained. So what happens is about a century later, after pre-Socratic physics, we get the sophists. The, the sophists used pre-Socratic physics to indicate that ethics and politics, insofar as they were derived from myth, were... Uh, merely supported by scarecrows, that these old legends and stories weren't real. So if they're not real, then there isn't any moral order, but a clever speaker can use other people's misunderstandings of the nature of the world to get advantage over them. And what this did was destroy the moral coherence of the polis. So, uh, this new scientific revolution generated a corresponding revolution in uh, human understanding. And the person that most perfectly exemplifies this is Thucydides. No more mythological nonsense about what makes politics go. What we, how politics works is revealed in the Melian dialogue. Big fish eat little fish. Hawks eat sparrows. Large, powerful armies destroy small, weak armies. And the fact that the weak don't like being destroyed is superfluous. What do you want hawks to eat? Grass. Well, what do you want big powerful empires to eat except their neighbors? This, for those that have been keeping score, is essentially the argument made by Thrasymachus in Book One of the Republic. Justice is the advantage of the stronger. We have the bigger army. So whatever we tell you to do is just, and whatever decisions we make about exterminating you, those are just as well. So um, there was a transformation, and you see it in the Oristia, you see it in the Tragedians as well, even in, in Aristophanes, uh, you see this transformation being uh, discussed and elaborated, but it had to wait for Socrates and his student Plato to find a way out of this labyrinth. And the way they work it out is to invent a new social science. Actually, it's a, it's a new universal science. And uh, it's Socratic dialogue arguing for 
the unity of Logos and Eros because Socrates loves what is good and true and right and those all find their realization either in the form of the good or in some other, some other mythic entity such as the uh, the role of the sun in the final dialogue he wrote, it's called The Laws, and the entire city itself is a gigantic solar observatory. And the cycles of the sun uh, are the cycles by which the various uh, deems and tribes perform various kinds of rituals and, and governance. So, uh, the Greek Enlightenment resulted in a new humanistic endeavor. It's called philosophy. It also cr created a new realistic history in politics. And it also created new kinds of art, something like a tragedy. So uh, that was the response to the, second to the first scientific revolution. All in the, before this, all we had were, were myths. Now, this kind of science, which I call Science 2.0, also happened in China about uh, 300 BC. And this was done by Tzu Yen and the School of Naturalists. And what happened there is that most of the terrestrial sciences, like uh, 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 mineralogy or uh, medicine or uh, technology of various descriptions. Um, these were fully secularized. They had their uh, assumptions, which we may find dubious now, but it, what they, they, but like Hippocrates, uh, Chinese medicine and uh, Chinese architecture and Chinese uh, uh, public works, think of the Great Wall, um, all of these are made, are expedited, and uh, furthered by the fact that they had a new and very powerful understanding of nature. The difference here is that this is only true for the earthly sciences. For the celestial sciences like astronomy, which at this time, of course, is the same discipline as astrology, uh, they are still mythic. They're like the 1.0 view, right? Uh, there came a point where Thales decided that uh, the that eclipses were natural occurrences and that they could be predicted if you had the right data, which he apparently got from Mesopotamia. And everyone was astonished when he was able to predict an eclipse. The Chinese never broke free from that earlier mythic tradition when it came to things like heavenly bodies. So the idea there was that the uh, dragon was eating the sun, and if you performed the right activities here on Earth, you could drive the dragon off and the sun would be all right. So um, what China and, and, and uh, Greece have in common is that both of them broke through to a new uh, non-mythic uh, practical account of the natural world. And when you allow these, this new understanding of the natural world, which rejects supernatural, magical, non-explanations, um, what you're going to have over time is a buildup of examples and information and techniques. Now, the Greeks were too smart for their own good. So uh, after a brilliant century or two, they destroyed themselves, the smart, cultivated group, the Athenians lost, and the blunt instrument Spartans won, but Greece was still never going to be the great intellectual seedbed that it had been before. On the other hand, China managed, among other things, to maintain a border for the most part, uh, at least in part because they put up an immense wall, and they got a considerable amount of... Uh, advantage from that public works program that went on for centuries 
because uh, they were open to the steppes of Central Asia and mounted uh, uh, cavalry armies were always a danger. But the key thing is that until their encounter with the Europeans about 1500, um, the Chinese were able to use this new sophisticated conception of at least terrestrial nature. And what they did with that was develop a profusion of technological transformations based upon their understanding of things like that. So it's not an accident that the, between, say, well, let's say the time of Christ uh, to about 1500 AD, the Chinese produce almost all of the great technological breakthroughs that our species will depend upon later. This includes the printing press and paper. Uh, paper doesn't seem like much of an achievement, and of course the Egyptians had it very early on, but the Chinese made it uh, practical, and they used it for record keeping, among other things. And what that led to, along with a literate, uh, uh, governing class of, of mandarins, um, what that meant is that they uh, could keep records that were very accurate that, didn't, that weren't made of mud or stone. Not only did they have the printing press and paper, they also developed gunpowder and the mariner's compass. Now, the mariner, what we call a mariner's compass was not used when the Chinese invented it very early for navigation. It was used for divination. In other words, trying to figure out what the future would bring and what the movement of the, the needle would, would uh, prognosticate. So the point is this, both China and Greece had scientific revolutions. The result of these scientific revolutions was a, a profusion of new ideas in art, politics, law, religion in Greece, and the same set or a similar set of transformations in the understanding of self and society, All right? So uh, this is before uh, Qin Shi Huang Ti, the first emperor, uh, closes down all the schools of thought in favor of legalism, a very Hobbesian and uh, uh, a very Hobbesian and extreme version of draconian laws uh, enforced severely. Now they got to, to develop this conception of the natural world for you know, 12 or 15 centuries. That's the reason why they were producing new ideas, even in a very conservative culture like China, and that the rest of the world was very fortunate to get these ideas from the Chinese. One of the, I mean, uh, the connection between India, Persia, and the West allowed sooner or later for various kinds of uh, information transfer and uh, the transfer of gunpowder and it's, uh, you know, the uh, specialized techniques that it required um, completely transformed warfare in the old world. And the result of that was that politics was completely transformed. The advent of gunpowder means that city walls are unavailing. You can't hide behind them. And what that means is that... Uh, the uh, feudal reciprocity between uh, farmers and their lords who would offer them protection, now there's no protection to offer. So that reciprocity, which we have been dying for a long time, is completely gone by the time gunpowder gets, it gets introduced. All right. So what we see then is that what people think of themselves is transformed in historical time into uh, what people think of the world around them. They're connected. There's a dialectical interaction, right? 
learning more about the world around us prompts us to ask questions about ourselves, prompts us to, new, to use new sets of assumptions, or to ask questions in a new and improved and better focused way. So uh, in both of these of the cases, China and Greece, where we had these, these uh, scientific revolutions, we're also gonna have a cultural revolution, a religious revolution, uh, a revolution in art. And uh, that those trans transformations would become permanent elements in Chinese culture. Remember that once the, uh, many of the scholars are put out of work during the, uh, uh, the, the age of warring states in China, and also when Qin Shi Huang Ti comes to power and uh, decides to reduce the influence of the mandarins, uh, many of them found themselves out of positions. They took jobs as teachers and many of the traditional uh, uh, amplifications uh, of uh, their respective schools of thought are made by this class of itinerant teachers. Now, the third transformation in the history of, the, of uh, science is actually what happens in Europe uh, between, I don't know, roughly 1300 and 1600, all right? Um, you might want to drop it back a little further. We could go to 17 or 1800, but in that block, in that area of time, we have several overlapping tendencies and transformations. Uh, the one I'm most interested in here is the development of Enlightenment science, which is in a way the development of Renaissance science. And Renaissance science goes back further than you'd believe, right? Uh, mathematical investigations by Fibonacci, right? He's a, would generally be described as a medieval. There are the Oxford calculators who are, who had started graphing functions. Uh, there's the development of eyeglasses, uh, which involves the grinding of lenses, which are going to turn out to be very useful when you decide to, uh, create microscopes or telescopes. So what happens here is that there's a rediscovery of ancient, uh, of ancient knowledge. And this rediscovery prompts uh, an, an attempt at integration between the traditions of medieval Christianity and these new ideas, which were of course, of course very old ideas, but which had been un unavailable for 10 centuries or more uh, due to the disruption and destruction <clears throat> that was occasioned on the fall of the Western Roman Empire and the hard times that <clears throat> lasted for centuries thereafter in many cases. Um, what happens is that instead of trying to understand the world from the perspective of God and get the synoptic God's eye view, that I would say is characteristically medieval. Um, I would be inclined to say that what we get in the Renaissance and later in the Enlightenment is the human eye view, right? Think about the fact that medieval cathedrals are all shaped like crosses. As a matter of fact, it's the biggest building in a medieval city. It's also the tallest and it's shaped like a cross. And the architects could vouch for that because they had the plans, but nobody else could vouch for it because God had nothing to say about it, all right? Remember that an age that lacks helicopters what they're doing is <laughs> marking out a cross that only God can see, all right? Um, the development of perspective in visual art is an excellent example of this motion from a God's eye view to uh, a, a human eye view, right? Um, if you look at medieval altarpieces, you see little peasants and pretty big archbishops and then gigantic pope the reason why is not because these were 
poor artists. If they had wanted to represent the world as human beings see it, they could have. They just had no interest in doing that. I mean, when you can talk, when you can represent things as God sees them, who cares what people think? Poor, fallible creatures that we are. So there's a, if you know one of the great uh, kind of uh, manifestos of the uh, Renaissance is uh, Pico's uh, uh, oration on the dignity of man. And uh, this is a very suspect book because much of Christianity had been directed at understanding human beings not as inherently dignified, but rather inherently flawed and sinful. There's a, a new note being sounded here by <clears throat> Pico when he praises human beings and human nature. <clears throat> uh, we see this humanizing tendency in the development of perspective and uh, in uh, visual art. We also see it in, uh, uh, say, uh, political science, when we get Machiavelli's this worldly rather than otherworldly view of politics. This is something that, that Machiavelli has uh, that's in some ways similar to Thucydides or to Hobbes, but Machiavelli is interested in heroism, which is what makes him characteristically uh, Renaissance. Whereas by the time we get to Enlightenment, Hobbes just thinks that this is a dangerous world and you should keep your head down. And if you want to act like a hero, you're just going to get your head chopped off that much faster. So in uh, politics, in uh, visual art, and also in astronomy, when Galileo hears about the telescope and constructs one from the description. Uh, once he looks at the moon and discovers the moons of Jupiter and uh, transforms the old God's eye view of the heavens into an all too human view of the heavens, which shows that they are not perfect, that they have mountains and uh, craters and they have rough terrain. And also that the, uh, uh, the seas, the mare on, on the moon, are just a different kind of material. They're not, uh, they're not real mare. And we only thought that there were a small number of heavenly bodies. Uh, of course, there are innumerable stars, but there are a few heavenly bodies that um, were known to move. Uh, when uh, Galileo discovered the moons of Jupiter, he was adding to the collection in a most uh, shocking and dangerous way. The point here is that Galileo, Copernicus, Kepler are all pushing down or pushing on, a, on a intellectual dominoes. And once they start those dominoes falling, they're going to reach their crescendo, their peak, when we, when Isaac Newton reduces all of motion to three simple equations. Newtonian mechanics and calculus are the kind of crowning glory of enlightenment science. Wouldn't have been possible without the great achievements that were developed by people like Galileo or Kepler and the, what I would call, and I would call that this, uh, this Enlightenment-centric science, this uh, which reaches its acme in Newtonian mechanics, I would say that we're still under that uh, under that aegis when we get to Darwin's theory of evolution. I believe that's 1857, and what that did was conclusively show that human beings were a part of nature, and of course that created not just a a, a religious crisis but it also created philosophical problems because we had a new and shocking and transformative idea of who and what we were. We used to be uh, the crown of creation, as Hamlet gives his famous encomium on human beings. And yet, at the same time, we find that we're the 
random outcome of a billion different accidents, which had no purpose at all. So this is going to leave a legacy of all kinds of interesting problems. And <clears throat> uh, the art and science, the politics and ethics, the religion and uh, uh, folklore of, given culture, of every given culture that had access to this new science had to be changed. There's no, no way to keep it intact. And uh, the fourth transformation seems to me to happen at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century. And this new breakthrough, uh, I would describe, I, mean, I would cite the transfer, the jump away from Newtonian mechanics as our account or our, as our essential account of the universe to uh, relativity in the quantum universe. So 1905, we get the special theory of relativity from Einstein. And when we do, when I do that, or when he does that, um, all of our understanding of ourselves also has to change. We thought time and space were static. Turns out we were wrong. Uh, we thought that the world was deterministic. Well, when they get to the quantum level, this determinism seems to break down in quantum mechanics, and you get these probabilistic functions, but no certainty uh, due to the nature of observing or the influence that the observer inevitably exerts on things as small as electrons. So this created a kind of crisis of science as well as a crisis of philosophy. And uh, if I had to find a, a new genre uh, of art, I would be tempted to say that uh, video and radio, or well, radio first, but then video, um, takes the audience that it previously existed for the novel, right? Think of uh, Charles Dickens or Dostoevsky being serialized with long chapters in periodicals that went on for years. Well, no one nowadays has the patience for that. So we like audio and video, and those are the corresponding art forms that have emerged from this new understanding of the world. You can't have electricity until you know how electrons work. And uh, that work was done, of course, uh, uh, by Maxwell, uh, connecting electricity and magnetism. And then that was still further connected uh, by Einstein and his successors. And now that, as far as I understand it, scientists are trying to find a way to broker a deal between the relativistic universe of real big things and the quantum universe of real small things. Uh, but if you notice, each of these scientific revolutions, they happen in increasingly short periods of time. In other words, history is accelerating. Who knows if or when such a construction, Science 5.0, gets put together. But if it does, um, it's going to require that all our other humanistic endeavors correspondingly are going to have to change. Uh, once we get to uh, the new science that we're in now, you know, uh, the implications go in almost every direction. The complexity is astonishing. Consider, for example, the, uh, the, uh, the importance of someone like Freud as, an, as, as someone who articulates a particular view of human nature. Now, he thinks he's a scientific, well, he's a doctor, and he believes himself to be a scientist, and he believes that he has scientifically discovered things like the unconscious, or uh, the structure of the soul, or uh, the real motives behind human activity, which even the agents themselves don't understand. It turns out that when, that prior to Freud, the enlightenment idea of the psyche or the self was the Cartesian cogito, the ego. It's one cell, it's one atom of consciousness. It's my soul or your soul, my psyche, your psyche. 
And it's one unitary thing. You can't break it up. That makes it the mental analog of the physical, natural, scientific idea of the, ma of the atom. The atom, meaning indivisible, is the smallest unit of matter and you can't break it down any further. Okay, it turns out, uh, starting around 1900, that it became possible to theorize and then actually split atoms into their constituent parts. And this turns, generates an immense quantity of intellectual uncertainty and new problems. Uh, of how to reconcile these new results with our previous network of ideas. And the same sort of thing happens to the Cartesian cogito, the minimal unit of consciousness that I could always look inside and introspect and tell other people about. Dr. Freud says, nine, your conscious part is only a fraction of your real self. The real motives that you translate into pseudo-rational terms are driven by sex and aggression. And these unconscious motives reveal themselves to those that know how to analyze human behavior uh, as being symbolic and not just physical. The idea is that uh, if you have someone who uh, washes their hands a hundred times a day. Uh, that's not just a waste of water and soap. That's a symptom. That's a message from the unconscious about guilt trying to get out. When I think of Lady Macbeth. So um, both quantum mechanics <clears throat> and Freudian psychoanalysis split the indivisible and one is the indivisible human soul, and the other is the individual uh, unit of matter. And when that happened, both souls and matter proved, proved to be highly unpredictable, less uh, conscious and self-assured, uh, under less control, and... Uh, less coherence than we had had in the Newtonian universe. The cultural transformations, the age of world war, the age of European self-destruction, right, were all the main uh, players in colonialism, destroyed each other in a mutual suicide pact. The result was that Europe, which had produced these extraordinary ideas and continues to produce extraordinary ideas, lost its dominance over the globe, which it had carefully uh, worked for over the last, over the previous 400 years. And what was left was a binary alternative uh, in the peripheral, periphery of uh, uh, the West, which would be Russia and the United States. All right. This is a way of saying that I think that the new history that's going to be written will be in the light of, or in the shadow of, depending on how you look at it, of the new scientific understanding we have of the world. And what that's going to do is uh, give us things like uh, the decoding of archaic DNA or the uh, transformation of the neural and synaptic structures uh, resulting from various cultural practices, um, the emergence of, his, of religion as a foundational aspect of history which undermines and I think finishes off uh, the economic determinism or the materialist, the materialist coherence of the earlier uh, view of primitive human beings uh, as undergoing uh, uh, 
a Neolithic revolution. But I'll have to come back to that. One more 